Uh, my name is Sean Aiken, and I'm the superintendent of the Shale Area School District. I just want to take a moment to thank you for being with us today. Uh, I obviously would prefer that we would be in person meeting in an auditorium or something uh, similar to that, uh, but unfortunately we're in this remote setting with uh, Zoom. Uh, we're going to go through a presentation with you today uh, that's going to be about 20 to 30 minutes or so, and then after this presentation, uh, we're going to give you the opportunity to ask us any questions regarding our reopening plan for this school year. Uh, Dr. O'Black, do you want to uh, quickly explain the, the Q&A and then you come back to it later? Yeah, as Mr. Aiken indicated, the question and answer period will occur following the presentation from the administration. We will go over some guidelines regarding the commenting and questioning period. Um, in the meantime, while the presentation is going on, if you could please keep your microphones muted. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is our, our third meeting for the day, and uh, I want to make sure that, that I give adequate attention to each of the details <laughs> along the way, uh, and we provide enough time at the end for, for questions. As I mentioned, we're just going to run through uh, some slides with you and talk a little bit about our reopening uh, strategy and plan for the school year. Um, but please understand that these decisions that we make are, are not taken lightly. Uh, we wrestle, we've been wrestling over these decisions for months, um, and we're committed to not only make sure that our students are safe uh, when they come in this building, but we're also uh, ensuring the safety of our staff as well, too. Uh, and when we do return, we wanna make sure uh, that the transmission of the virus or the health and safety of our students is also uh, kept as low as possible and that our students and staff are safe. Uh, so every decision that we make uh, is really based on, on these two statements here right now uh, when thinking about the reopening of our school. So uh, back in the month of June, we uh, put together a bunch of different task force groups that, that identified uh, areas that we were going to address in this process of reopening our schools. And along the way, we considered these four principles uh, to be paramount for our planning. And the first I've already mentioned is just ensuring that the safety of our students, uh, that's our highest priority at all times. Uh, also the safety of our staff, another extremely high priority. Um, we also noticed that, that we needed to be flexible. Um, we need to be prepared and ready for um, whatever comes our way. Uh, whether we start in the, the most restrictive environment in a virtual setting, uh, we move to a, 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 the least restrictive environment as uh, in a traditional setting or in the middle with the hybrid model, uh, we recognize that, that we need to be able to uh, move back and forth quickly uh, and be able to adjust seamlessly. Uh, consistency was also a factor that we talked a lot about. Understanding the level of support that our students need. Um, you know, we recognize that, you know, when these decisions are being made, we have to take into consideration the, the social and emotional needs of our students. Recognizing that as of now, our students have been out of school uh, for five months. In, in the coming weeks, uh, when uh, September 8th rolls around, our students will be out of school for, for almost six months. In October, uh, when we're proposing bringing students back in the hybrid model, our students will have been out of school for seven months at that time. Uh, we recognize that that's, that level of consistency and normalcy uh, is going to need uh, our undivided attention. The last piece that we really uh, put a high value on, a high priority on, was community input. We recognize that our students uh, and families uh, deserve a, a wide spectrum of people looking at this, this situation and thinking about experts in the field of, of uh, medicine and, and uh, mental health and operations, uh, medical professionals. Uh, we wanted to, to have 
um, a very diverse group of teachers and staff members and principals and central administrators, uh, people, parents uh, we had on the team. Uh, we had a wide variety of people, over 70 people that actually served on the task force committees uh, that, that provided this recommendation. As mentioned previously, uh, there were three specific models. Uh, one of the most frequent questions that we get is, why can't we be in a traditional model? Uh, our traditional model, uh, five day in person, uh, obvi obviously with some safety precautions, this was our goal from the very beginning. When I met with the steering committee back in June, and we also talked with uh, our task force committee, our goal, at that point in time was to return in a traditional setting. Um, then is, is the process uh, um, went through, we went through the process this summer of talking and meeting. Uh, we really had, had identified the hybrid model as the model that, that we would select. And, and we released this tentative, tentative announcement back in mid-July about this hybrid model. And, and this hybrid model we'll talk about in a minute contain some in-person instruction, some virtual learning, uh, and then a combination of, of both during the week, and then also the option of giving people uh, virtual learning. Uh, again, virtual is, is similar to how we ended the school year in the last uh, three months of the school year, uh, fully remote, um, you know, instruction, uh, not only through the iPad and technology, but also utilizing uh, Google Classroom and other resources uh, that, that are available. So these are the three models that, that we planned for and created to be ready really for any situation that, that we were um, put into at the start of the school year. So a couple important updates to think about. Um, as shared last Wednesday night in the Education Committee meeting, um, that we determined at that time, uh, that we were going to go virtual, 100% virtual, for the first four weeks of the school year. Uh, one of the other important things to note there is that uh, the start of the school year got pushed back. The first day of school is now Tuesday, September 8th. Uh, that um, four-week stretch uh, that where we'll be in virtual uh, learning model will conclude on Friday, October 9th. Our hope and our goal is to transition at that time uh, to hybrid learning. Uh, we realize that many families have questions about the Titan Cyber Academy, and we're still working out some of the details. Uh, we recognize that the, the commitment form is due this Thursday. What we do want you to understand is there's flexibility with this decision. If a parent selects Titan Cyber Academy here in uh, August, on, on August 13th, and they change their mind on September 13th, we're okay with that. Uh, we want to be flexible. Um, we also recognize uh, that there's a need. If we're going to be in a virtual learning environment, there's a tech need. Uh, and just like back in the spring where we transitioned, uh, we thought about the tech needs. And we've continued to think about this. And we are pushing down the 7 to 12, 1 to 1 iPad initiative into uh, K to 6 as well. So our goal by the uh, beginning of the school year is that every student in the district would be equipped with a device at home, uh, an iPad device. Uh, so that's one of the, the transition points for the school year as we continue on in this, this virtual setting. We want our students to be uh, prepared at home uh, for learning. One of the, the main questions that we receive on a, on a daily basis is, is why are we starting the school year 100% virtual? There are other school districts in Allegheny that are considering hybrid. There are other school districts in Allegheny, a handful of them that are even considering like a five day option, uh, some of them at the, the K to five, K to three level. Um, why are we considering the 100% virtual? And it really comes down to one decision. And that is the fact that we, want to ensure the safety and well-being of our 4,200 students and our 500 staff members. Um, we base these decisions on data that we received from the CDC, the Pennsylvania Department of Health, and the Pennsylvania Department of Education. We are also in weekly communication 
with the Allegheny County Health Department. Um, some of the complexity around the quarantining and the isolation and uh, the social distancing and the contact tracing has made uh, you know, this idea or this notion of returning to school very complicated. Uh, and we think with, with uh, the uptick in uh, the month of July in the, the Allegheny County, and then also um, the concerns related to managing in that at the school level, whether it be on school buses, hallways, classrooms, cafeterias, um, anywhere and everywhere related to school uh, would make it significantly more difficult to do that. And again, this virtual model gives us the opportunity to start the school year in a consistent, um, more restrictive environment where our teachers can focus on one platform and focus in on uh, making this uh, virtual learning relevant and beneficial for all students. Again, our, our expectation is it would be robust and rigorous uh, and that it will look more like regular school. We'll get into a little bit more of what that's going to look like here shortly. So one of the, the questions that's asked often is, is how is virtual learning in the fall, in the, the first four weeks of the school year, going to look different than it did in March, April, and May? Again, the spring was an emergency closure. Uh, we were not prepared for that. And I would say that now we've had the opportunity to learn from some of those opportunities back in the spring. Uh, we've talked um, a lot about asynchronous and synchronous learning opportunities for our students, uh, the importance of live teaching, following some, some type of schedule that gives our teachers and our students uh, some sense of normalcy and an expectation and accountability around work, uh, adhering to our grading policy, uh, obviously, we had modified the grading policy in the months of uh, March, April, and May. Uh, we think that assessments, um, tests, quizzes, projects, uh, whatever they may be, are extremely important for our, our students and their learning uh, to fill those gaps and ensure that there's engagement. Uh, we think that that, that type of uh, engagement with our teachers uh, virtually uh, can be uh, similar to what it was uh, prior to the coronavirus uh, occurring in March. So again, our, our notion here is, is that we are going to present a, a very robust and rigorous uh, instructional program for our students and something that is going to be significantly improved from the spring. That's not to say that, that our teachers didn't do their very best given the, the circumstances, but we recognize that there's areas for growth and we're committed to seeing that growth through professional development, webinars, uh, other learning opportunities that our, our staff has had over the past few months and will have for the remainder of this month. Dr. O'Black, we, we throw terms like synchronous and asynchronous and around uh, quite often. And Dr. O'Black is going to talk a little bit today about what synchronous and asynchronous is all about. Thank you, Mr. Aiken. And we just wanted to take a, a few moments to make certain that everybody was aware when we use, uh, use these terms, because as a school district, we find benefit both in synchronous and asynchronous learning opportunities. And our staff has been volunteering to take trainings this summer, and they are continuing to receive professional development in both of these areas so that they can truly blend all of this together to make the, the best possible learning uh, scenario despite the conditions that we're in. So in a synchronous environment, um, you know, it's very e easily put that students learn at the same time. So this is often what, you know, parents or families would refer to as live instruction. Uh, communication happens in real time, uh, and because it's in real time, it has the possibility of being more engaging and more effective, and it allows for our teachers to give instant feedback and clarification very much like if the child was in front of them within the classroom. Obviously, we can't fully, fully emulate that environment, um, but we do look for opportunities through the synchronous learning to do that. And that can take on forms of video conferencing, you know, live chat, such as a Zoom meeting, or even live uh, streamed videos um, that the teacher 
uh, is, is conducting the lessons and then also recording because we do understand that, that not all students and families are gonna be able to sit in front of a live synchronous lesson uh, at the same time. We know that there are a lot of family dynamics at play right now um, and we want to be cautious about that. So all of the live uh, synchronous sessions will be recorded uh, by our faculty uh, so that students are able to either go back if they weren't able to join in on them or if they needed to um, do a reteacher or remediation or, or just re-listen to a difficult concept again, it would be available. In an asynchronous environment, so much of the instruction um, that you and your children would have experienced in the spring of last year, uh, it's where students have that ability to learn at different times. Um, the communication is not live. Um, and because of that, oftentimes it's more convenient and um, flexible, and it'll allow students to work at their own pace. So these might be learning activities that are done after a lecture or an in-class um, you know, activity, um, but it would also give students the ability to complete work independently uh, and then reach out to our staff um, if they had any follow-up questions or concerns. Again, some examples of this are, are email, screen class, flip grids, videos, um, or blogs or, or comments that, uh, that your children may have participated in, again, similar to last, uh, last spring. So over the past uh, few weeks or so, we've been talking about our commitment. You know, what are, what are we committed to as a district? If we're going to start out in this virtual environment, how do we meet the needs of our students? Uh, we see that I, I've put our mission statement here and we talk a lot about this and, and are we true to our mission? This doesn't change just because we're in the virtual environment or the hybrid environment or the traditional environment. Again, we, we have a focus on social and emotional needs, uh, the social emotional well-being of all students. We recognize that, as mentioned previously, our students are going to be in an environment uh, virtually uh, where they don't have as much connection with their peers. Uh, they don't have as much connection in, in, with their teacher. Those relationships, you know, back going back to, you know, the middle of March, uh, that was a significant blow to our students. We recognize that those relationships and that well-being of our students, um, there are still some things that we can do as a school district to meet the needs of our students virtually. Uh, again, it's gonna take all of us working together, our teachers, our paraprofessionals, our school counselors, uh, our principals, uh, all of us working together. Uh, another thing that we're committed to is the curriculum that's taught by our teacher. We recognize that this is a difficult situation and we may be transitioning from uh, a virtual platform to a hybrid platform or a hybrid platform to traditional or traditional back to hybrid or back to virtual. And that needs to be done seamlessly. Our curriculum, uh, we are, are confident that, that teaching it uh, through the virtual platform um, will meet the needs of our students. Again, we're focused on uh, bridging some of these gaps um, that, that may have occurred as a result of March, April, and May. Um, we're also committed to meeting the needs of our students with IEPs, with 504 service plan agreements, and students with uh, GIEPs. Um, some of these specific needs around uh, students with, with special needs uh, are extremely challenging in a, in a virtual environment. We recognize, though, uh, that the accommodations and modifications may look a little bit different, but we are 100% committed to finding ways to meet those needs. Uh, and we'll do so individually. Uh, we'll seek the support of uh, our, um, our teachers, our special education teachers, uh, and our whole entire team working together. Um, our school counselors across the, the district and our social workers will continue uh, to work with our families. Our school counselors will continue to work with our, our students, uh, providing lessons and support. Um, our expectation for our teachers is really around engagement, uh, making sure uh, that there is interactions between students and teachers. Uh, we expect that there's going to be, uh, you know, classroom type settings, uh, daily interaction. Um, we understand the importance of these relationships. 
Again, also, as we learn a little bit more uh, about how to become better educators virtually, uh, we'll be looking at best practices and doing some professional development that will provide our teachers with the tools and the resources they need to be successful in this environment. Again, we recognize that the transitions between these different scenarios are difficult, and we want to have as much flexibility uh, and provide our, our parents and our students with as much uh, information and communication as possible as they make decisions and navigate between these different environments. So one of the, the questions that also asked of us often is, is what do we expect of our middle school and high school students? What do we expect of our elementary students, our primary school students in this, this virtual uh, environment? Last year, we had a lot more flexibility in, in the spring around when students could log on. There's going to be a greater expectation for our students to log on in specific times that would be related to their school day. Uh, we understand that this may be possible in most situations, but it also may not be possible in some situations. So there will be some flexibility with this, and there will be a recording uh, for these live uh, in-person classroom sessions, or live virtual sessions. Again, um, students in grades seven and eight will follow the same virtual schedule with a nine 40 minute period daily. Um, again, uh, the students at the high school level will have a similar schedule as well. Uh, we think this added accountability and class structure will bring some sense of normalcy to a student's day. Uh, and we're looking for a way to engage with them uh, so that the gaps in learning are not significant when we're able to come back together. In fact, our goal is, is to provide uh, a normal instructional day, even in this remote setting. Again, teachers were expecting uh, interactions uh, with uh, engagement with students and teachers and students and students working together in collaboration uh, as they would in a, a normal traditional classroom. Uh, that's our goal and our expectation for our staff and our students moving into this virtual platform. So what happens following the district-wide 100% virtual learning. We're receiving a lot of questions about the hybrid model. And I'll just give you a, a brief overview. Some of the questions that we, we have about this model when we released it back in uh, the month of July involved, involved you know, if my student, you know, my child is in the first part of the alphabet, maybe he or she goes on Monday and Tuesday. And if my child is in the student cohort B, then uh, he or she goes on Thursday or Friday. Uh, it's important to uh, recognize that um, our students are engaging in this in-person instruction on these days uh, and that they would engage in uh, remote learning or virtual learning on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday or the opposite three days when they're not in school. This is a model of what that may look like. Uh, so we would have cohort A going to school on Monday and Tuesday, cohort B going to school on Thursday and Friday, and then students that choose the Titan Cyber Academy in school Monday through Friday uh, via the virtual platform. Uh, so again, this is kind of an overview of what it would look like. Uh, our hope is to move into this model on October 9th uh, when we can safely do so. And uh, this, this model provides some benefits, uh, some benefits to in-person learning, uh, students engaging with other students in a school environment, uh, less students in uh, the school to assist with some of the social distancing concerns, um, potentially less students on school buses uh, that could also help with some of the social distancing concerns. But overall, uh, this model, the hybrid model, uh, you know, has some challenges but it also has some significant benefits as well. So one of the frequently asked questions is, is what does my child do on remote learning days? Is it just busy work? That's the, the comment that I get most often. And I would say our goal is never to, to give busy work. Our goal is, is to provide meaningful instruction and, and relevant learning assignments that may include things like project-based learning or 
um, problem-based learning or um, some research, uh, something that is going to engage them and, and help support the learning, the in-person in learning that took place on that Monday or Tuesday or Thursday or Friday. Um, again, weekly plans posted on Google Classroom uh, in the agenda format, similar to uh, um, the regular school year. Uh, we want to emphasize that Google Classroom will be a used, uh, utilized across the district K-12 to to bring consistency. Um, again, uh, just to reemphasize that uh, the expectation is that we would utilize synchronous and asynchronous lessons on these remote days. Uh, and that we will utilize options such as Google Meet um, and Google Meets and also the Zoom meetings. Uh, recognizing that there's going to be some consultation time with our teachers, just to check for understanding, make sure that there is um, some formative assessment and understanding of what students are working on and an opportunity to ask questions if they have them. Dr. O'Black is gonna take the next couple slides and he's gonna talk a little bit about our Titan Cyber Academy. We've had a lot of questions around the Titan Cyber Academy, what that looks like, how is it different, and uh, how can we um, transition either back into a hybrid or traditional model or stay in Titan Cyber Academy you know, for the year. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. So a couple of just highlights on the Titan Cyber Academy. This is the district's 100% virtual schooling when the remainder of the district is in hybrid or a traditional return to school. So this will follow a similar format to the first four weeks of school where students will engage in synchronous and asynchronous learning uh, via our online learning platform five days a week. And again, many similarities to the 100% um, virtual start to the school year. Um, all of the learning would be housed in Google Classroom. Um, and it is going to be consistently uh, taught using the Shaler area curriculum, um, in most cases taught by Shaler area teachers. And this consistency will allow students to move between virtual, hybrid, and traditional seamlessly. Um, I think it's important to note that in our planning, uh, it was very important to us uh, to recognize that there may be students who begin in a hybrid uh, return to school. However, um, for various reasons, they may need to transition to a 100% virtual platform. So we wanted to try to allow for students to move within and among um, learning opportunities or learning solutions at any given time. Uh, additionally, uh, we are looking to support, uh, have support services for our IEP 504 and GATE students through our student services department. Our students would still have the opportunity to engage with their school counselor. And, you know, back to some of the uh, areas that Mr. Aiken outlined, we really are focused on high levels of engagement with our staff and administration. Um, specifically in this scenario, because we will not have these students in front of us the two days a week that the hybrid students will be in school. So those relationships and communication um, are only even more important uh, when it comes to this scenario. One of the questions that we do get is what's the advantage to selecting the Titan Cyber Academy um, versus other um, cyber or charter school options that may be available to families. Um, and first and foremost, we, we do believe that the consistency in the curriculum um, in the utilization of our staff um, is, is very, very important. And, and secondary to that, we, um, you know, our students are eligible to participate in our clubs and activities. Um, and if they um, are in the program upon graduation, they receive a Shaler Area Diploma. Uh, we have had a lot of questions at the secondary level relative to courses and, and course selection. Um, our district intends to offer a complement of courses in our Cyber Academy uh, to the extent feasible. Um, we do have various course providers that we have existing partnerships with that if we need to use them um, for a specific course or for a specific student, um, that, we, that we would be able to do that. Um, additionally, the asynchronous component for the Titan Cyber Academy will occur during identified periods or on the Wednesdays um, where everybody is, is at home. 
And it's important to note that when a teacher is dedicated to both hybrid and the cyber academy, the times for live instruction may vary uh, based on the availability of the teacher. Uh, all textbooks, technology, and other necessary materials will be provided by the district. And parents seeking additional information regarding this option can contact their school principal, um, and they'll certainly consult with us um, for any specific questions or answers that you may uh, need for that option. I think Dr. Grasick has joined us for uh, this middle school meeting, and she is actually going to be able to speak to the special education services. Dr. Grasick is our director of people services here in the Shaler Area School District. Dr. Grasick, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to just give you an overview of where we are with special education supports and services, as well as other areas in student services that help support students. Um, we have between students with IEPs, GIEPs, and 504 plans, um, over 1,100 students receiving those types of services. So when we were looking at this model in the spring, um, it, it is going to look significantly different than it did back then. We um, are still in the planning phases of what this will look like as far as providing social and emotional services and supports for students <clears throat> and how guidance count school counselors um, and social workers will be able to stay connected with our students on a regular basis. Um, in addition to that, the students who receive special education supports and services um, typically have um, specially designed instruction into their IEPs. So doing that from a virtual setting will look a little different than it did for, um, for those students in the spring, where there will be more direct instruction and direct contact with their, with their teachers. Um, those students with um, IEPs and GIEPs will still receive direct instruction by their special education teacher per their specific needs um, that are written into their documents. Students will also be able to re, uh, receive their related services such as OT, PT speech, um, and when we're looking at those sessions, um, it was a little bit more of a challenge to try to do group sessions and live sessions in the spring, but we are moving toward a more direct instruction for those services now going into the fall in order to meet those IEPs with compliance. Um, so the staff who do those related services will be actively working with me, um, the school psychologists, and the special education uh, department chairs over the next few weeks in order to fine tune how that's going to be laid out. And then that collaboration will then allow us to be able to reach out to families and talk through the process and what that's going to look for your particular child. Um, we will still continue to offer students with 504 plans, the accommodations as guided by those plans. Um, and again, we know that this is, this is a, a broad um, brush that we're painting right now for this, these services, but um, we have been working on plans for this, and then we are going to be fine tuning them with the actual staff in those departments over the next two weeks. So that by the end of that, we should be able to push out to parents and have teachers start connecting with parents so we can explain to you what that looks like for your child in the upcoming school year. Thank you, Dr. Grasick. So we've been thinking about, you know, if we're gonna open in this, this virtual model, what are some ways that we can start the school year uh, and still provide, you know, some opportunities for our students, especially our students that are transitioning to new schools, uh, whether it's kindergarten, fourth grade, seventh grade, ninth grade. Um, we think these or orientation activities are extremely important. Uh, you know, one of the uh, opportunities that we'd like to see happen is, is the opportunity for our students to meet their teachers for this coming school year. Uh, we also recognize just getting materials to our students and families, iPads, textbooks, workbooks, supplies. Um, we're going to be working with our different schools. The middle school will have specific days that will be geared towards uh, the distribution of these items and also the opportunity to meet those staff members. Another question that comes up often is about food service. You know, if my child is receiving free and reduced lunch, uh, will he or she still get that during this, this 
uh, virtual option. We are working with our food service provider and nutrition group, and we are um, going to identify some location, a location in the district or locations in the district where those food options will be available to our families. Uh, additionally, there's going to be questions and concerns that arise. Uh, we are going to have additional Zoom meetings that are scheduled with our building level administration, and they're going to be able to talk specifically. A lot of the discussion today has been around high level, uh, general type topics, uh, but our principals in the coming weeks will be able to get into the details as to what this plan is going to look like uh, for the start of this school year. Um, if you have a specific building level concern uh, or a specific question, please feel free to contact your school principal. Uh, also, if um, you, know, you have a question about um, you know, a class or a teacher or anything like that, your school counselor should be available as well too. Uh, so I, I'd encourage you to, to reach out to your principals uh, or myself, Dr. O'Black, or Dr. Grasick. Uh, we can certainly help you. And we want, uh, we understand there's a lot of questions right now. And we want to be a source of uh, answers and resources for you um, when you have those questions. Okay, I think Dr. O'Black is going to explain uh, how the Q&A session is going to operate, and then we'll just jump right in. Thank you, Ms. Draken. Um, just uh, to set some um, parameters for question and answers, if you could please raise your hand in the participant window to the right of your screen, and when recognized, I will call the screen name that you've registered in Zoom with, if you could unmute yourself and state your name. And again, just to reiterate, individual questions that are personal in nature should be directed to your building principal, or the appropriate department. We also will ask that so that we can answer as many questions as possible that you limit your comments to three minutes today. Okay, hey, our first question for today comes from the screen name Rebecca's iPhone. Hi, my name is Rebecca. My son is in the middle school. I also have a child in the elementary school. Um, I'm calling to see, are the teachers required to be teaching live from the classroom and not from their homes? We're still working on the details for that. They're going to be teaching most likely some from the classroom and then also some from home. Uh, so it, that those details are still being ironed out at this time. Again, you know, we want to transition people back into the school safely, uh, ensuring social distance and, and making sure the environment's uh, safe for them. Uh, again, that, uh, those details, though, are, are still being worked out, Rebecca. Okay, and my other question is, is the districts that are around us that are going back five days a week or the schools that are, what are they doing that they're ready that we're not doing that we're not ready? Yeah, What's I know the, the difference. There, yeah, I know there are a couple of districts locally that are talking about the five day in person. Um, I think Pine Richland at the K to three level is talking about that. Fox Chapel is kind of floating that idea out there at the elementary level. I know there are some districts in the South and the West that are also looking at the, the five day model. Uh, I have no idea how those districts can meet the, the social distancing guidelines that are out there with the Allegheny County um, expectations, the CDC recommendations. But again, I'm not here to criticize what they're doing or explain what they're doing. I just, uh, you know, we, we take the information that we have and think about in terms of um, what's the right decision for this school district. And that's how we've arrived at this decision for the remote learning. Okay, if my child needs help is individually, are they going to be able to get that? Yeah, of course. And, and I would say that there, there's going to be opportunities for um, consultation with teachers. If there was something that your, uh, your child doesn't understand, if they're working on a problem or, uh, you know, not understanding a concept, 
Um, one of the, the, the good things about the asynchronous uh, video learning is that they can go back and rewatch the video on multiple occasions to try to understand it. But we still know that they still may have questions. And so we think that consultation time with the teacher is extremely important. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next comment is from the screen name Gregory Mazzara. Yes, hi, thank you. Hey, while you were talking about the Cyber Academy, you mentioned uh, uh, course availability and outside, I think you said uh, content providers. Uh, I'm not sure what you meant by that. Could you, who, who are those providers? Could you tell us a little bit more about them? Dr. Black, do you want to take that? Yeah, certainly, Mr. Aiken. On occasion, we have had a longstanding cyber program at our secondary school, so in our middle school and high school, and we have partnered with the Allegheny Intermediate Unit, uh, which is a, a local agency that we work with. Um, it is not our intent uh, at this point in time to use them uh, for the majority of our courses, but um, you know, specifically at the secondary level, if we had one course that only had one student in it for online, we may look at using their services. Um, but again, it, it, it is a longstanding relationship that we've had that our cyber program at the secondary level has, has run through. It's called Waterfront Learning out of the Allegheny Intermediate Unit. All right, thank you. Our next question today is from the uh, screen name J-A-S-Z-A. -S Hi there. I have a question. Uh, since a number of cases were on the decline in July and the back to school task force appeared to be making the decision to go hybrid, why was a last minute change made that we would go to all learn all online learning? It seemed like it was awful last minute when plans seemed to have been made by the back to school task force that it would be hybrid. Yeah, the, when we made the decision in the middle of July and released the information to go hybrid at that time, uh, we, you know, obviously had seen an uptick in numbers in the month of July. Um, but as we started to, to really plan and get into the hybrid model and start to identify what it would look like in the schools, at that time, we realized that there was no way that we could adhere to these social distancing guidelines and ensure that our students and staff would be safe in areas like the school buses, uh, the hallways, um, the cafeterias. And so when we started to really dive into that plan, because the whole, throughout the entire process of the task force, we had kind of looked at each plan as if we were going to go into that model. Um, so our goal in, in mid-July was to go into that hybrid model. Our goal in, in mid-June was to go into the traditional model. But again, to, to change course requires a tremendous amount of discussion and thought. Uh, and we really felt like the safest and best option for our students and for our staff uh, was to go the route of the virtual model for the first four weeks to the school year. Again, our, our hope is to transition to hybrid on October 9th. Uh, we we hope that we can do so safely, uh, but again, you know, none of these decisions are made um, quickly, uh, nor with uh, like a knee-jerk reaction. But well, it kind of seemed like it was. Not to interrupt you, sir, but I read the back to school, the task force report, and it seemed like they had everything implemented to do the hybrid, including on being in school and social distancing and. And you're only looking at one fourth of the student population being in school at any given time. Uh, no, it would, be a little, it would be a little bit greater than the one fourth, but I can assure you that the planning that went into the hybrid will not be wasted because we've talked about the importance of going from like the most restrictive environment, which is the virtual, to the least restrictive environment. In the process of getting there, uh, we will have to go into the uh, hybrid situation at some point. So you're right, we did spend a significant amount of time talking about that and what that would look like. Uh, and the more we got into it, the more we realized that it, that it was not the right decision at this time. 
for us. Thank you. You're welcome. The next comment um, for today is from Kathy Rudolph. Hi, uh, my name is Kathy Rudolph and my son's gonna be starting seventh grade. I was just wondering more nuts and bolts, what platform will you be using for the synchronous lessons and are the courses all gonna be housed in Google Classroom still? Yeah, we're ut utilizing Google Classroom K to 12 just for consistency sake. And uh, that should help our, our parents and, and our students as well. Um, so anything that you would add to that, Dr. O'Black? No, Mr. Okay. So will the synchronous lessons be via Google Meet or Zoom or what platform will they be used for? It'd probably be a little bit of a combination of both, I would imagine. Uh, obviously, you know, our seems like uh, a lot of our staff and students are very comfortable and familiar with the, the Google platform. So there'll probably be quite a bit of Google Meet, but I would imagine that Zoom would also be utilized. Okay, thank you. The next comment from today is the screen name Eric's iPad 3. Hi, uh, I had a question regarding if and when we move to the hybrid model. Um, will the students that are at home be getting the live instruction from the faculty member in the classroom or will it be a different uh, teacher? It will be, it will be from their uh, instructor. It will be from their teacher. So they'll be teaching live in front of a class and then the remote students will be listening in on the same. So are you talking about when they return in like a hybrid setting? Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. And, and some of those details we're still working out. Um, not exactly sure what that's going to look like in the hybrid model. Uh, but we recognize that continuity, uh, is extremely important, flexibility is extremely important, and like a seamless transition. Because I would imagine that, that we're going to have um, students that you know, are, are at home and then uh, the parents change their mind and they want the student to go into hybrid. So we've gotta be as flexible as possible. And we recognize how important it is to um, not have the gaps in learning and you know change from one program to another program so we still have to work out some of the details there uh eric but um hopefully uh we can make it as seamless as possible for our students okay i have uh one more question uh how will matt uh for the hybrid model while they're at school how will masks and social distancing be enforced like what happens uh when they're not following it yeah it's 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 a great question because, you know, especially we're, we're talking with middle school parents now and high school parents next, you know, kids that just outright refuse. I mean, we, we, have to, we have to work at that. And I think education is the key, is helping students understand that it's, you know, it's not just about keeping your, yourself uh, safe and healthy, but you're also uh, helping others. Uh, by, you know, keeping a mask on. And we know this is going to be a challenge. You know, we're talking about students that are 13, 14, 15 years old. Uh, and so our goal is, is to educate our students, work with them, and continue to emphasize the need uh, to wear masks. Um, there's a number of school districts that are talking about mask breaks, mask breaks and stuff like that, just to give students an opportunity to take the mask off during the day. Uh, because we all know wearing a mask for, you know, six, seven hours straight is, is going to be very difficult for students. Okay, thank you. Our next question for today comes from Michelle. Michelle, are you still with us? Okay, we'll move on to our. Can you hear? Yeah, we can hear you, Michelle. Can you hear me? Yes. 
I did email about that, um, broke her iPad last year, and um, I knew that no one was able to fix it. Would she still be able to get one for the, the start of the new school year to homeschool her? Yeah. Uh, did you share your, if you could maybe contact uh, either Dr. Stennett or Dr. Howard, and then they can uh, work you together with uh, the tech people, and uh, we can work those details out. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Our next person to comment is Danielle Mino. Hi, I have an eighth grader, so I have a, just a, like maybe three questions. Um, will schedules be mailed home? So we have an idea who their teachers will be because it's a little bit more complicated, let's say, than like my fourth grader schedule. Um, so will there be at some point in time schedules mailed home? So like we know what her specials or she got into a foreign language program. Um, the other question I have is, will the middle school allow book bags to be carried throughout the school day? I know they're not allowed, but considering that the masks kind of obstruct your view sometimes, and these kids are carrying lots of books and iPads, um, will they be permitted to you know, use their book bags throughout the day? And then my third question is, um, not all the buildings have air conditioning and I know like the elementary and the middle school the temperatures can get really really high with the fact that these kids might be wearing masks like what may or may not occur like you said like mask breaks um like the kids going to be able to take these masks off like during the classroom or because my hope is that we do get back into the classroom if colleges and universities are able to kind of transition and do like a hybrid model and social distance effectively, you know, we should be able to kind of do the same thing. Are you able to answer those questions or is that for a different, like a middle school meeting? Yeah, a couple of those questions may be more specific to uh, like a specific middle school meeting, uh, but I, Dr. Stennett or Dr. Howard, are you on uh, the call? Yes, I am. Either one? Dr. <clears throat> yeah, I can answer this. We're, uh, hi, hi, everybody, it's Dr. Stennett. Um, principal of the building. Uh, we will be mailing schedules home. We're finishing up a new master schedule with the hybrid in mind. So you can look for that schedule to come home. And, uh, and, and quite frankly, it's going to be a little easier this year to understand that schedule when it comes to you. Um, so that, that will be coming your way pretty soon. I'm hoping in the next two weeks we'll be finished and able to mail that. Uh, in terms of book bags, yes, we are planning on allowing students to use book bags throughout the day. I think it's pretty critical that we not use lockers as touch points. Um, we do think the bags are going to be a better choice uh, for our students. And then lastly, uh, in terms of high temps and masks, um, we are going to be doing mask breaks. We are talk we're going to be talking to our teachers about giving kids special breaks and having teachers on duty to make sure kids get breaks so they're not just in a mask, uh, you know, all the time. I think one of the things that's going on uh, in the communities, schools specifically, is we have this image in our mind of what a school is going to look like. Uh, what I can assure all the parents in this meeting uh, is that we are going to treat them like human beings and we are going to be monitoring very closely and creating an environment that's safe, but also take into account the needs of kids, whether it be uh, drinking from the water bottle, taking uh, five kids outside distance so they can get some fresh air. You know, we're going to learn and we're going to have a rigorous uh, instructional model, but we're also going to be very careful about middle school kids having time to move. We know young adolescents need that time. We will be taking that into account and looking at their social and emotional development as well as giving them some physical ways to move around so they're not just sitting at a desk the whole time, work, work, work. That's not what we're after here. So I think we're going to do the best we can. It's going to be fluid. It's going to take us a little time to think of a new way in a hybrid model, but I can assure you we're going to take care of business with that. Hopefully that answers your question. It does. Thank you. You know, Dr. Senate, one of the things that you mentioned there, and, and Danielle, to your question, I think that uh, one of the unintended consequences or benefits to uh, the 
delayed start time to September 8th and then the, the four weeks of um, virtual learning is just that, is, is the heat in, in some of these schools. And we don't have air conditioning in five of seven of our schools. Uh, and the third floor, fourth floor of the middle school and the, the front wing of the elementary school uh, can be pretty brutal in uh, May and June and parts of September. Uh, and so that's um, certainly wasn't one of the driving factors for the decisions that we came to. Uh, it was really more geared towards the healthy health, safety and wellness of our students, but certainly uh, will be a benefit. All right, thank you so much. Our next question for today is from Vincent Wallander. Yes, hi, good afternoon. Um, so my questions are really tied around some of the cyber education and, and some of the, the, the support that would be offered to students and, and parents in particular. Um, is, will there be any sort of live help desk? Uh, knowing that the, the students are gonna be required to be on at specific times in the day uh, to address any, any bugs. And, and those that work in IT can appreciate the fact that those happen relatively frequently, especially with video conferencing and, and some sort of uh, like document specifics or timing. And with that said, will there be leniency around uh, deadlines and more or less delivery of certain, certain assets and things like that with regard to, to specific work items? Yeah. I think that's a good question, uh, especially the, um, the, the first part, you know, moving to like a K to 12, one to one and a virtual platform. We know there's going to be significant bugs and issues and, um, you know, tech, you know, troubleshooting that, that's going to be required. That was one of our questions earlier in the day, too. Uh, and so, yes, it, it's going to be imperative that, that we have some assistance there to to help our families and help our students kind of um, you know, answer any questions that may come up. Uh, it's certainly, you know, we expect that there's going to be some challenges along the way. Uh, so that's, that's the first part. The, the second part, I, I think flexibility has to be key. It's one of our guiding principles through this process. Um, again, we want there to be accountability and we want to ramp up the level of engagement and instruction and rigor. Uh, but at the same time, we've got to balance that with understanding that there could be some challenges because of the virtual setting, that there could be social emotional challenges. Uh, so we recognize that there are, um, you know, considerable challenges facing us with the virtual model at the start of this school year. And I, and I think that we have to be patient with that and we have to be uh, flexible with our families and flexible with our students. Um, but understanding at the same time that there's going to be uh, grading, uh, there's going to be assessments, there's going to be formative assessments, checking for understanding, quizzes, tests, summative assessments. Uh, so uh, yeah, we, we have to find the right balance between uh, understanding what, what some of the challenges that our students are facing, yet at the same time, uh, you know, filling some of those gaps in, in learning. Thank you. One last quick question. Is there, any, is there going to be an option for digital textbooks in some regard for the Google Classroom platform? Sure. Dr. Black, do you want to take that question? Yeah, in some cases, but not all. Um, we do have some of our textbooks, uh, our, more, our newer textbooks do have uh, ebook components to them. Um, if a student is 100% virtual, they still will have the opportunity to pick up uh, hard copy textbooks that they would be able to use then in their virtual environment. So when an ebook is not available, a hard copy text would, would be made available. Great. Thanks very much. Our next question for today comes from uh, Kelly Schiffauer. Hi, everyone. How are you? Hi, Kelly. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your endless efforts to make school happen this year. Um, speaking as a parent in the community with two children that attend Shaler, as um, also an educator in a neighboring district, which is going to school five 
full days brick and mortar and there are so many things that we're not ready for. So I am absolutely 100% thrilled that Shaler has gone and decided to go virtual for the first four weeks. I think that is the smartest thing that you could have done at this point in time. <laughs> But um, speaking as a parent and obviously as an educator, um, we have used a learning platform in my district for the last several years. Um, the only concern I have, I know that you continue to say that you want it to be flexible and fluid for both parents and students, which I think is great. Um, the only concern with that is I'm not sure how you plan on setting that up in the classroom and how it will look just because um, knowing that that job responsibility to deliver the curriculum for say live streaming, which we're doing, as well as to attend 100% um, in the classroom as well, is obviously almost uh, impossible to, to do your job the best way for both um, you know, LSI as well as in-person instruction. So I wasn't sure if you were planning on doing you know, specific, designate specific rooms for you know, live streaming or however Google or Zoom or the learning platform, and other classrooms strictly just for the face-to-face in-person instruction. So Kelly, I think if I'm hearing your question correctly, you're just wondering what, what that's gonna look like in the hybrid model. And Correct. how will we you know, um, stream instruction out potentially to students who are in the remote environment or the virtual environment? Right, as well as, you know, the students being present in the classroom, and then I don't know if you'll assign, you know, certain classroom students to certain classrooms, um, how will that teacher be able to communicate and have the same type of curriculum assigned both in the classroom as well as LSI? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, Kelly, one of the, the questions that you ask is one of the things that we've been wrestling with for a few weeks now and what that's going to look like. Uh, so the hybrid option is a great option when it comes to like on paper. Um, it makes sense, right? Kids get to be in the classroom. They get to engage with peers. They get to engage with the teacher. Um, there's a sense of normalcy there. There's less students, so it's, it's easier to social distance. But some of the questions that you're posing about um, specific rooms being designated and how we uh, access instruction for students that are in the, uh, the remote setting and then also in, in person. Those are some of the things that we're wrestling with and we still have yet to completely finish or finalize the plans for. Uh, but I can assure you that we're working towards that. Um, the work that we've done up to this point in the hybrid model, at, like I mentioned earlier, is not wasted because at some point we're going to be transitioning back to that but we've just got to figure out how to do that and not completely uh, burn our teachers out, I think is one, and you know, do it fluidly where it still meets the needs of the students that are in that Titan Cyber Academy as well too. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next question today is from the screen name Joe. Our next question comes from John Antonucci. Good afternoon. I just had a quick question about going back to the hybrid model and transportation. I know there was a survey a couple months ago. Um, it, I guess whether or not, if it was mandatory for parents to drive or if not, would you probably guess that the, the time it takes to get to and from will be lengthened? So I think the, the, first, the first part of that is, is, yeah, the survey identified or, or asked parents to identify if they would be able to transport their child to and or from school. Uh, and you know, that, that information was helpful to us and, and will be helpful. And I know there are many parents that, that do transport their children to and from school, and that would be helpful. Um, the second question about uh, are you asking about how much time students will be on the school bus? Yeah. Okay. 
again, that, that I, I'm not sure we have definitive answers on that question because it really may depend on the day and, and how many students are riding the bus. And, and we, at this time, do not have um, definitive data on that. And that could fluctuate day to day. Uh, yeah, because some, some kids could ride one day and not another day. Now, typically speaking, our bus rides are not too, too long. Uh, I know I've worked in other districts where uh, it seems like they maybe were a little bit longer, but I, I would imagine that, you know, some of our rides can be, you know, anywhere from, you know, 20 to 40 minutes, depending on, uh, you know, where you are in the stops. Okay, and one last question. With the delayed start, did that extend the school year? Yeah, the, our last day for the school year is actually going to be Friday, June 11th. So we were able to push the day back eight days, or eight, the start of the school year back eight days, and then we were we pushed graduation and the final day of school back five days. So we were able to kind of work out some days in the, the school year so it didn't push it back more than that one week. Okay, thank you. Sure. And our final question for today is from Jen's iPhone. Hi, my name's Jennifer. Um, so I'm, I'm having problems understanding how the hybrid slash online virtual is going to happen. So your, your school hours are from, I have it down here, 718 to 225. You have nine 40 minute classes. Okay, so I understand the need, the ELA, science, math, history, all of the above, but how are you going to do gym, chorus, band, uh, if they're going to have sewing in seventh grade, home ec, or wood shop, and whatever in eighth grade, how are you going to go about grading that if they're going to be home taught, hybrid, or if that's what virtual classes are going to be like? If that's understood as a question. Well, I think that um, I could I could let Dr. Stennett talk a little bit about that, but I want to clarify too, just for um, the timing purposes. Uh, the high school meets earlier, like seven eighteen to like two thirty. The middle school is a little bit later than that. It's probably closer to like seven forty five, seven fifty, almost eight o'clock. Uh, to about, you know, 245, 250. Um, specifically around the specials classes, and this has come up in, in every meeting today. Uh, okay. Our goal is, is to have uh, those classes take place just as they normally would. And maybe in phys ed, maybe there's an expectation around some type of physical fitness at home. And we, we consider and believe the, the movement, the wellness, the fitness is extremely important. Obviously, it's going to look very different in that type of environment. Uh, but we also think that other classes, whether it's art or music, uh, are going to be, need to be, you know, occurring as well. Uh, so our goal is to have all those special classes um, just like we would in a normal school year. Um, they may look very different. Uh, so... Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's going to be a challenge. There's no doubt about that, but our expectation, and I know there were some really creative ideas last spring in like some of these tech ed classes, um, and some of the things that were done in the art classes, uh, some of the displays that we received at the end of the year, just some of the work samples from some of our teachers were tremendous. Uh, so I think it is going to require some creativity, uh, some ingenuity and innovation. Uh, but I think our teachers are up to it. Uh, Dr. Stennett or Dr. Howard, did you guys want to add anything to the, the specials classes? Yeah, sure. Uh, just a reminder, uh, philosophically, middle school is about exploring. So um, those classes are not, uh, you know, we don't expect uh, children to become, you know, masters of art, you know, Renaissance artists. But we want them to explore different opportunities, obviously, as they get ready for high High school and start thinking about possible careers or how they can develop and be a well-rounded student. Uh, in terms of the schedule, as always, we'll still rotate kids through different experiences. So there's a rotation for a period, so we will fit all those in. Obviously, it's going to look very, very different in a hybrid, and how we assess that will be different in the hybrid model. So we're working out those details with our teachers 
Um, spring, it was a little less rigorous, but it was still rigorous to the point where we did have great creative ideas. We know that music is really important. Yes. And we know that, uh, we know these you. You know, arts important. We know family consumer science is important. So we are looking for ways to make sure that they get the experience, they are assessed appropriately, but also creative ways to do it in this different type of environment. It's going to be um, it's going to be something we're going to be working on as we go along for sure. But uh, I'm pretty confident we can find ways to do this and be uh, make it appropriate for our kids. This is Dr. Howard as well, and I'm just going to build on what both uh, Mr. Aiken and Dr. Stennett said. Um, this is definitely something because middle school is, is definitely about um, experiences. Um, when we're looking at these types of classes, it's, it's what the skill is. And so there's a lot of different things that um, students are able to do from home. So when we're looking about what is the skill, students will be able to do some of that work creatively from around the home. And just to build, for example, with um, what Mr. Aiken said, um, things like you know physical fitness at home, or looking around um, and helping to think about, for example, in family consumer science, things that they could do in terms of making their own food, for example, and, um, and documenting that process. All of these things are very um, important skills that they'll be able to partake. So thank you, that was a great question. Thank you. Um, well, that's why I was questioning about the virtual versus the hybrid. Virtual classes with the online academy, I. I mean, I can't even see anything on there except for the ELA science and everything else. There might be a special for a language, but it doesn't say what the specifics would be on how long the classes would be or how long the day would actually be in terms of being completely online or hopefully coming back to school at some point. That was, that's where I think a lot of us are having problems with deciding on if we're gonna go virtual and keep our kids home, or if we're going to do the two to three days, the three day home and trying to build on the fact, maybe we can come back to school at some point. It doesn't look like it's gonna happen. I hope it does. But this is where we're all having problems deciding on what to do with our children, like schooling. Well, I, I wanna reiterate something you mentioned earlier. And, and that's that, that you may pick uh, the Titan Cyber Academy now, or you may pick a uh, hybrid now. <laughs> and you may change your mind in a month and that's okay. Uh, we're gonna try to be as flexible as possible with people through this process, understanding that it's very difficult. Um, so just understand that um, we'll work with you uh, and you may change your mind and that's okay. Other parents may change their minds and that's okay too. Um, but understand that um, we're gonna have, try to provide as much flexibility as possible, understanding that this is just a, a, a challenging situation. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Our final question for today is from Heather. Hi. Um, I was curious if you had gotten as far as thinking about class changing. I know I've heard some mention of either districts or recommendations of ideas of, for that sort of thinking differently of moving teachers rather than students and was curious if you had gotten to that point of planning yet. Yeah. For uh, like class changing for the hallways and sure. stuff. Sure. Yep. And I, I know that our teachers have, or excuse me, our principals have been working on that with their teachers. And I know, Dr. Stennett, you and I had a conversation about that a few weeks ago, and I'm sure the, the details of that will uh, be rolled out in the, your um, middle school meeting, but did you want to address that? Sure. Uh, I think it's appropriate. We've made a decision. We are going to have the teachers move to the students. Uh, uh, okay. That does not, so pretty much what's going to happen is the students will go to a homeroom and that'll be the room for the day. However, I want to have a caveat. We are going to be building in breaks and movement for the kids again, so they're not just sitting in a room all day working. That's not what we're after with the hybrid model. And it's going to take some time to work out what that's going to look like. But uh, as of now, we are switching how we do middle, whereas uh, the students will come into their homeroom, and that's going to be the room the teachers will be coming to them based on the different subject areas. Okay, so then like their specials, would they stay with their specials teachers able to move to there? I know some of them have. Yes, they're they also going to be moving into their rooms the, as well. 
Yep. Okay. That's our plan for now. And I, I want to be honest with everybody in the room. That's our idea for right now. But in mm -hmm. practice, we're going to have to look at that. You know, there is other, one other thing I wanted to say. You made me think of this, ma'am. Thank you for the question. Uh, we're going to evaluate every single day. Uh, Dr. Howard and I are going to meet with our key teacher leaders and talk. If we feel like something's really not appropriate or work the way we want it to, we're going to quickly uh, adapt to that circumstance, watching the kids, seeing how they're reacting, see how they're working out in a hybrid model. If, are they able to handle that kind of workload? Those kinds of things. So I don't want people to feel like, you know, we're absolutely 100% set in stone. This is the way we have to do it. We've got to watch our kids and see how they're reacting to this model. And we will be fluid, we will be dynamic, and we will uh, make sure that they're successful. So that might mean, for example, one of the rotations we feel like is something they could do in a different location as a group, and that, that group could move as a group. But what we're not going to do is mix the kids up. That would be contrary to the safe situation we're looking for. We want kids to stay in that kind of cohort stay in that kind of homeroom group together. So that that's kind of the plan at this point. Okay, which I can see as being fairly challenging scheduling wise with kids in potentially different languages and different maths and you start mixing multiples oh, yes, of is. those together. <laughs> if you'd <laughs> like to come help me schedule, ma'am, <laughs> give me your name and number. You sound like you know how to schedule middle school. Come on over, we'll take, we'll take the help. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Careful, he will put you to work. I know, this is Heather Schneider. Oh, hey, Heather, yeah, you do. <laughs> you will be working. I, I know, <laughs> I know he'll be putting me to work. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Drake, we could have a couple more questions uh, come up since our last person. Would you like to continue? Sure. Um, we have our next comment is from the screen name J-A-S-Z-A. -S Hi, I just had a thought talking about facilitating the kids when we go into the hybrid. Years ago, we had portables at Birchfield. They were actually like uh, trailers that were set up outside the school and we had them there for several years. Has any consideration been given to using these at the schools to enable the uh, social distancing we have we have not i know that at one time i think there were some portable units here at the uh the middle school as well too when it was the high school back in the 70s but yes, no, we, we have not we have not given any consideration to uh the portables um i'm not i i know birchfield birchfield alone if we're just talking specifically about a school they have space in that school that we could expand uh, but again you're talking about you know the number of teachers that we have and everything like that so it it, it works in coordination with each other um, so it, it's not so much about needing more classrooms because if we just expanded to more classrooms then we would need more staff and we would re reduce the number and we can't afford to increase the number of staff members that we have uh, but yeah, we, we have not given consideration to uh, like mobile units or portable units uh, on school property. Well, then what if 100% of the parents decide they want their kids to do hybrid? How will you keep them separated without adding staff and portables or some other means? Yeah, I, and I think those are some of the challenges, ma'am, that we still need to work through yes. and figure out how that can be possible. And I hope, our, our sincere hope is that the numbers in Allegheny County continue to get better and we learn. Uh, I've heard today uh, already that there is some uh, guidance that the Pennsylvania Department of Health is, is considering putting together and it would actually go uh, align with potentially getting some information. So I think as we uh, get further down the road, I'm hoping that more significant metrics and matrix would help us make good decisions and be able to uh, do some of the social distancing that we need to do. Uh, like I said earlier, the hybrid model looks great on paper, um, but the complexity of it is, is very challenging. 
And then I just have one final question. With the, with the buildings not being used, will there be any reduction in the, the expenses of the school district? You know, you're not going to have to be heating them. And I, I mean, honestly, our hope is that we'll be, students will be in the schools, you know, come October 9th. So right now there's no realization of, of saved, you know, expenses as far as heating and cooling um, goes. Uh, but, you know, I think as we go forward, if, if something drastic happens here and we're not able to um, open schools, that's the worst case scenario, obviously, um, we would have to look at, at ways to, to reduce our, our energy footprint and be able to uh, save money in that respect. Uh, but again, our hope is that teachers are, are, we're still working out the details on this, but our hope is that the teachers will utilize classroom space to teach from and, and come in and, and I mean, we've had a lot of teachers uh, express interest in doing so. We still have to work out all the details of what that would look like. Um, but our hope is, is that we would be utilizing these schools fully soon. Paul, are we going to any of Pat's house? We can turn the light off or maybe I'll just run in and turn the light off. I still have to work. I just had one final question and then I'll let you go. Um, several people have asked you and I think they've said it different ways, but I'm not sure it's been really explained yet. Suppose a math teacher would be teaching in the hybrid. He would be teaching an on-school class Monday and Tuesday. Would the kids who are remotely learning from home that Monday and Tuesday have the same math teacher at the same time as the kids who are sitting in the classroom or would he be teaching them at a different time? I think that was the question asked like three times. Yeah, so I don't, right now the plan is not to live stream the instruction out right from the classroom to the person who's sitting at home uh, so that the in-person instruction would be at the same time as the, you know, that, that same time. So that Why is not- Why could that not happen? Well, I mean, there's, there's some devices, I, I, you know, we'd have to look at the technology that's available for that. Yeah. Um, we'd have to think about uh, some of the challenges with that. I, I mean, it, it could be an option that we consider and we have actually discussed that. Um, there's a number of, I think just recently uh, a state, publication talked about some of the deficiencies of doing that um, live uh, instruction to both, you know, a hybrid option in person and at home. Uh, but that's something that, um, you know, it, it's, we're not ruling anything out right now, but we are going to make safe decisions uh, for our students. Uh, that's what we've decided. Uh, again, I think it, it, you said that the question's been asked three different times. Some of the hybrid options we're still working through. Obviously, you know, we, we don't have great answers as far as like kind of the live feed and stuff like that and how it's gonna work and, and um, how we can teach both, you know, how a teacher can teach both in person and remotely at the same time, you know, whether, you know, uh, the same day or, you know, different days of the week. So that's, that, those are some of the challenges that we're working through. Uh, via the hybrid model uh, that are not uh, perfectly clear to us at this time. Thank you. And then our final question for today is from Jill Dem Dembrowski. Hi, I was just wondering when you're going to decide what math uh, students are in and how will that be assessed because they didn't have the PSSA? Dr. Sennett or Dr. Howard, do you want to talk specifically about this, this math question that's specific to the middle school? Sure. So we did have a placement uh, based on our, uh, our matrix. Uh, we obviously were not able to do the Orleans Anna algebra readiness test. So we are using uh, a different matrix without that care, without that, uh, qualifier and we have placed students in a math appropriately based on their prior work in the elementary as well as the seventh grade. Uh, we will also be looking at that placement 
based on teacher recommendation and the other areas that have, um, you know, we typically use every year on our spreadsheet, which is just a point system that places them in the map. That will be coming out with their schedule. So all students will be getting their math placement with a schedule. And obviously, if there's questions surrounding that placement, we're going to be able to do that. So in the next couple of weeks, we should have that information out for parents. But it's based, it's based on the same thing we've done for the years past. It's the only thing we couldn't do was the uh, algebra readiness uh, placement test, the Orleans Hanna, because of COVID. So we're just relying a little bit heavier on the other uh, indicators, which are grades star assessments, teacher rec, and all the different placement opportunities and uh, matrices we use for that placement decision. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, uh, well, I just wanna take the opportunity to thank everyone for joining the call today. Uh, we appreciate your support. Uh, we will continue to work with you uh, as educational partners, and we recognize that there's probably still questions uh, leaving today. You may think of something afterwards. Feel free to contact either myself, Dr. O'Black, or if it's a building-specific question, uh, Dr. Stennett and Dr. Sh uh, Shannon Howard would be, would be great resources as well. Um, expect uh, a date coming soon for some type of Zoom meeting to give specific details uh, from the middle school administration. Uh, and once again, just thank you for being with us today and thank you for your patience as we walk through this together. I hope you all have a great day. You too. Thank you.